Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Gem of Secret Podcast. Donatella isn't here this week, um, mainly because I killed her and I ate her. Because if you've seen me in drag, I am fat. Um, no, seriously, she's actually just on a five-day road trip with Autumn Rain's Heart, one of our other, um, you know, sometimes she comes on to talk to us, but other times she doesn't. Um, so, so I have to do this all by myself this week, and so I got really lonely. Um, I decided to start reading a book, um, but then I realized that there's more than five words on the page, so I decided to pick up some web comics. Um, that was interesting, but um, then I decided to watch a bunch of Netflix, and that was kind of cool too. But what ended up happening was I got really bored with all that and realized that we did need an episode this week, and everything I talked about happened in the last hour. So, um, so the world is still falling apart a little bit. Um, Multnomah County, um, as of the release of this podcast, is expected to open June 19th from COVID to phase one, um, and that's going to be a really interesting dynamic. So over the last two days, Oregon has had had the um, its max amount of numbers for confirmed COVID cases over the last two days, and we're still expected to open on June 19th. So I'm really interested to see how that's going to work out. But like I said before, um, since I had to do this podcast by myself, and I didn't want to talk by myself for half an hour, I decided that I was going to do an interview. And when I was thinking about people that I wanted to interview, um, of course, the first and foremost is always thinking like right now I should be speaking to black voices to figure out like, you know, how they're feeling and stuff like that. But I've also realized that the emotional labor that even I've had to expend on certain subjects has been really taxing. So I decided to actually look on the other side of the spectrum and think about people who may or may not have been involved in protesting and be on the front lines and what that looks like. And then I also thought about maybe we should talk to our allies to figure out how they're feeling, check in with them and understand how they're doing. I recently just posted on Facebook talking about how we treat our allies. Every once in a while, we always say to ourselves that when our allies, um, a good ally is somebody who will be there for you always. And that's not always the case. Um, Sometimes allies get backed into a corner and feel like they have to make some hard decisions. And sometimes your allies even become the opposition. So later in the podcast, we're going to be talking about what that picture looks like, too. So the person that I thought of um, is Matthew. um, And he is one of the few people in this community who I actually respect. No, I'm just joking. I expect a lot of people. But um, bringing on to my podcast, everybody give it up for Matthew. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I know I like introduced you like it was a drag show. I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of questions for you. And actually, actually, let's do this. Let's do a brief little history of you. Um, let's so talk about uh, one, how long have you lived in Portland? Uh, number two, how old you are? Um, number three, your pronouns, of course. Uh, and number four, what's an interesting fact about you? All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Matthew Swisher. Um, I've lived in Portland a little bit of, uh, under a year. I moved here at the end of July, so I still feel pretty new to the community. But I've gotten the opportunity to get out a lot and meet a lot of people, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, I will be turning 28 years old this year. And something interesting about me, um, I'm not a drag performer. That's not interesting, but... Um, <laughs> I moved here to go to law school, so uh, that could be somewhat interesting. Um, We're going to be talking about protesting a lot on this episode, so I think it'll inform some of our discussions there. Yeah, definitely. I didn't actually realize that you moved here to go to law school. I did, yeah. That's really cool, because actually me and Matthew are both from Colorado. Were you born and raised in Colorado? No, I moved to Denver in 2010 for undergrad, so I guess I'm following schools yeah oh i thought we had more in common and now i'm sad yeah denver and grand (laughs) junction are very different places (laughs) that's a isn't that the truth um so yeah so um one of the cool things um one of the cool things that matthew has done actually it's not really a cool thing per se but matthew's been involved in a lot of the demonstrations and protests and movements that have been happening almost nightly here in portland and you know there's on and off dates for everybody and so specifically speaking matthew's partner um a drag queen in the community had posted a live video um you know where they were downtown really late um viewing certain things so i have so i have a bunch of questions about that night but we're just actually going to go back to the beginning and talk about matthew's history just a little bit to get us into this so how did you get into protesting and demonstrations and activism 
Yeah. Um, so I feel like I've been an activist pretty much all my life. Uh, I identify as a trans man and part of my existence in this world is that of an activist just having to advocate for certain things that aren't necessarily in place yet. But um, even before I transitioned, I started going to protests in high school. I was the president of my high school Save Darfur Club, and uh, I grew up in California. So when the Beijing Olympic torch came through San Francisco, my high school organization joined the protests up in San Francisco. So that was the first time I ever got up close and personal with a riot cop. I was a minor at the time. Um, I moved to Denver in 2010 to attend undergrad and uh, a lot was happening in Denver around that time. Um, I was really busy with school and kind of missed the Occupy movement and was not involved there, but there were a lot of homeless sweeps that started happening um, and other injustices even prior to the Trump election uh, where I started becoming involved in movements. Um, and then once uh, Trump was elected, everything in Denver kind of went to shit for lack of a better term. And a lot of these alt-right groups um, started appearing around the area. I mean, you're from Colorado as well. There are a lot of uh, people with some really shitty politics that make it not so safe for folks like you and I. Um, so I began uh, showing up to protests, meeting other organizers out in Denver. Um, there are some really cool jail support hotlines and other mutual aid networks that provide um, legal support and food and other kinds of just support for folks who are facing a hard time due to protests. So I got involved in all that. And then finally, some of my friends were arrested at a protest in Denver. And that was really hard. Um, so at that point, I got really involved in their court cases and got really interested in their legal situations and realized that there wasn't much that I could do um, as somebody without a law degree. And that's really unfortunate. And that's one of the worst parts, I think, of our justice system is how difficult it is for the everyday person to participate in their process. But that is what um, sent me to law school. And I, I came to Portland for law school for a clinic at Lewis and Clark Law that is the Crim Criminal Justice Reform Clinic. And it allows law students to work on cases uh, for folks that have already been convicted of crimes that have already served time in prison and um, just trying to take another look at their cases and get them some restorative justice. Um, so uh, I got involved with the National Lawyers Guild through my law school here in Portland, and they provide a lot of the jail support and legal support that I had gotten involved with in Denver. And um, with these protests here that have gone on uh, lately in Portland, the National Lawyers Guild is one of the organizations that has stepped up to um, take on some of the support for folks who are out there demonstrating and that involves um, providing a jail hotline and legal support to folks who may be arrested. Um, it also involves uh, getting documentation of police use of force and police interaction with citizens. Um, and so those are kind of all of the different histories in my life that brought me to be down in the protests in Portland lately. So, so I have a kind of off the wall question for you. Why do you, how do you keep your fire up? Like before we get into the details of the protests in Portland, um, how do you keep your fire up? Like the passion for the work, like when you know that you need to be out there, what's going through your mind and then kind of like, yeah, where does the passion come from? Yeah, well, it, it's definitely cyclical. It's cyclical. It's hard to know whether like the good things or the bad things fuel us first, but they definitely play off each other. There's a, there's a lot to be angry about and whether it's something that happens to me personally or something that I witness, um, definitely like a, a call to action personally is just something that I've always like felt within me. Um, at the same time, every time that I extend myself and pour my energy into trying, support, trying to support movements and trying to support other people doing this work, it reminds me just how cool things can be when folks come together around a common cause. Even being out there in Portland lately, um, I've seen some really beautiful moments of strangers helping strangers and it really feels like we take care of us and those are the kinds of reminders that people are good that I need 
to continue forward, not only as an activist, but I think as a human and as a, a trans human, a queer human, somebody who doesn't feel safe in the world all the time, like being in those moments and being able to contribute, like definitely also fuels the fire just as much as the injustices that I see and experience. That's really interesting. So one of my things in life is I actually say that there's multiple meanings of life. And one of my meanings in life is people, um, people helping people is a mm. meaning of life um, mm. is one of them. So that's actually kind of interesting that you said that. So let's get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, so, and actually this is an interesting perspective too, because you haven't lived here for very long. And so I guess let's talk about how you even heard about, yeah, people probably want to know, how did you even hear about their protests and demonstrations? How did I hear about the protests and yeah, demonstrations? in Portland. Um, I guess that's a good question. I mean, when news about George Floyd broke, I feel like I and everybody that I know was just immediately all of our attention was right there with hopefully the rest of the country or the world. Um, I can't recall exactly how I found out the location of the very first protest. Um, a lot of nights honestly blur together, but I know that often when there are movements, um, there's a request for the National Lawyers Guild to provide support and be present on the hotlines if there may be risk of arrest. Um, that also involves sending legal observers. Um, legal observers wear lime green hats that say National Lawyers Guild legal observer on them. Um, a lot of organizations as well as the police and media are aware of who they are and what they do as a neutral party. and. Um, so I, I believe I probably heard, out, uh, heard about it through those networks, but also it was pretty clear that there were going to be some demonstrations all, under, uh, all over the country that night and from then on. So, um, so on that first night, or actually, and it's fine if the nights blend together with this next question. So um, what was it like, before we get into like the negative side of it, let's talk about more of the positives of protests and demonstrations, obviously, because you can have speakers and things like that. So talk about what the atmosphere is like, the people you talk to, the speakers and stuff like that. Yeah, so th there was one gathering um, at a park that uh, I can't quite remember the name of. There's like a beautiful rose garden, but there was, um, there were a bunch of speakers. I, I believe it was on Friday. Yeah, there were a bunch of speakers there. And I remember the lawn was just like covered in tons of people. And folks were all really quiet and paying attention. And um, the speakers that night were, it was like the first night and they were very direct and they spoke to white people with passion in a way that I think I really needed to hear and others, but is like labor that only comes from like a deep need and pain. Um, I don't really know, words are really hard to describe it, but I definitely felt personally accountable and called to action to uh, support and participate in ways that I could. I was attending, you know, to try to do my job for an organization, but I feel like personally, you know, was really why I needed to be there. So Sure. And I don't think we did this at the beginning, but could you please offer for the class your race and ethnicity, since this is just an audio podcast? Absolutely. Um, I'm a white, uh, a white man. Um, I'm also Jewish. Um, and I'm transgender. So yeah. Okay. So all right, so let's get into it. So now let's talk about some of the things that you saw from recording and being an observer. Um, the things that happened, you know, on your partner's live cast and things like that. So talk about that experience. Yeah. Um, I was not prepared for some of the things that I have seen and experienced since these protests started in Portland and even... Ooh, like what? <laughs> right, even <laughs> seeing things on the media, like, just doesn't give the full picture. Um, you know, at the best moment, starting with the positive, I saw literally thousands of people who were very, very angry, like not taking out their anger on each other. And like being in solidarity while also having like having that moment of pain. 
and it was very powerful. Um, it was probably very scary to some of the people who thought that they were in opposition to folks who were out there. Um, really? Truth of the matter what, what is... You, hmm. No, I was like, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that the single voice, uh, that first night there was just like this solidarity and rage that really seemed infectious. And that was, I think, part of the call to action and folks who would like to see systems stay in place don't really like to see that kind of that kind of passion in a group of thousands of people and i think uh, some i think that yeah. kind of feeling of threat instead of solidarity is what started some of the police violence in the first place um so when you talk about police violence what do you mean um Police have been just using like a lot of weapons against protesters that I've seen. Um, the most that I have like, like maybe there were things thrown at police. I'm not entirely sure because that's not what I'm looking at, but I've seen police launch weapons at people standing with their hands up, um, use entire cans of pepper spray on people who are holding bicycles and standing in a line, um, trying to shoot journalists with rubber bullets. Uh, there, there are a lot of videos from people on Twitter as well, but it's not exactly what the, the news is showing. And it, mm. it's definitely not a warranted response to the reality of what folks are protesting and raising their voices for. So how can you, um, why do you feel it's your place as a person who isn't black to be on these front lines? with something that is sure police violence affects all of us, but um, it's also about the co the conversation of racism. So how do you navigate that? And what does that mean for you? Absolutely. First, I think it's absolutely important to be cognizant of the people who are physically standing around you and the voices that they have and the things that are being said. That being said, um, as a legal observer, uh, the job is to be a neutral party observing police violence, which happens on the front line. And for better or for or for worse, black people and people of color often are there on the front line. And those folks are the same folks who are most likely to be arrested, not only in the world, but also out in a protest. I have seen people of color picked out of groups of white people for arrest during the last weeks in Portland. If you look at the records of arrest, it is not the same ratio as people who are on the ground. And those instances of systemic racism and violence need to be documented because those folks already have the entire justice system set against them from the moment they're in handcuffs. I am still looking for ways to be there as a white person and not take up space but take up space when it needs to happen, as in sometimes those who are harmed the most shouldn't continue to be harmed the most when they ask for their voices to be amplified. I really agree with that concept. As a side note, um, this kind of happened in the Portland community too with black drag entertainers uh, holding bars accountable for their lack of inclusion or their racism. And I said online, and I've said to my friends, you also, so to, to go along with Matthew, what, what Matthew just said, it's really difficult to ask a black person to give up their livelihood um, for the cause because white people have not historically shown that they're going to give us a soft place to land. Like, so say my boss is racist and then I quit my job because all of my white friends and black friends are encouraging me to do as such. And then now I have no job and I go into the bar who supported me and was like, hey, I really love a booking. And they're like, oh, well, we're full. Um, and then so it's like putting black people in danger um, or and to endanger their livelihoods is kind of we have to really navigate that situation. And we have to be really respectful of people to um, when they choose to fight or they choose not to fight. Now, so tell me about when you got tear. Did you get tear gassed? 
I did, I did. But I, I also want to like acknowledge something that you said about, mm -hmm. you know, the brunt of that conversation coming back to the people who are asking for equality in the first place. And I think being an ally isn't always encouraging your friend to quit their job, but to ask why the job is something that they need to quit to feel safe in the first place. Ooh, that's and, good. And as somebody who's trying to learn how to use my voice and support in a way that doesn't always bring the burden back to the people who are marginalized in the first place, like mm -hmm. we need to ask why it's not designed in a way to be safe in the first place. I just wanted to acknowledge that what you said is like very real and could be like, like needs to be a whole big other conversation. You know, actually, and I want to pause on it too, because like the, that's a really good point. Um, why it's almost like why do we need to even have the conversation in the first place and why wasn't it brought up sooner and how are we not holding people accountable to those things as well when there are missteps in place that are very public um mm -hmm. and it's because i i saw that video today about where the lady asked her like would anybody here want to switch places with a black person in the way that they live their lives and nobody stood up obviously and it's like so white people do acknowledge that a situation is crappy how many times, and since this is a drag queen podcast, like how many times have you at, seen your white friends want to go to Chick-fil-A and, you know, when it comes to the queer stuff, or how many times have you seen your friends get some of those racist palettes for their makeup? Like, and they kind of just justify it because it doesn't affect them at that level. Um, and yes, it was a little bit of a detour, but it's a really good... So with what Matthew said, I do want our listeners to literally think about that and understand if you're being complicit in some of the negative actions happening in your own community. Um, we're not necessarily asking you to solve them tomorrow, but maybe just be thinking about them because that might actually lead to some systemic change. So um, just because this is going to be a preachy podcast today, everybody, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so back on top, bad, back on topic of the protests. Tell me about when you got tear gas. I want to know. Yeah. Did it hurt? Oh my God. What did it feel like? <laughs> It was my first time, um, <laughs> so I feel like I definitely can play Never Have I Ever a whole lot more now. Um, <laughs> though at the same time, yeah. like the <laughs> city of Portland should realize that like they just tear gassed in like an entire generation or two, and now they're not scared of it anymore. And so they're using batons now, but they used a lot oh. of tear gas in the beginning when people were really scared of it. <laughs> um, uh, tear gas is thick and heavy it's sometimes yellowish if it's the nasty stuff the white stuff's not as bad there are different chemicals used and i don't know much about them because i'm in law school and not a chemist but um mm -hmm. it tickles and it scratches in your throat and your eyes to a point where it feels like you're having like an asthma or allergy attack and you just can't really see or you know, you're coughing. Um, you just have to like keep breathing. Um, I'm really fortunate to have like a lot of adrenaline and there were a lot of times where folks around me were suffering and having a hard time seeing. So I was more interested in making sure that they had water to like rinse their eyes out with or connected with a medic. Um, didn't worry too much about it, but um, right. yeah, my partner and I both got tear gassed and it was a bonding experience. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So we are going to take a quick break. And normally this is where I would ask Donna how she's doing tonight. But since she's not here, Donna, out in the universe, I wonder how you're doing tonight. It's a podcast it with Coco and Donna. Tell a podcast. Check it out. Tune into what they tell you podcast. Check it out. With Coco and Donna. Tell a podcast. Check it out. And we're back, everybody. I hope you really enjoyed that commercial, if there is one. I'm not quite sure how this stuff works. Donna usually edits these. So we are, once again, we are back on with Matthew Swisher. Um, he is definitely giving us all the tea about what it's like to protest. And this has just been a really amazing conversation. Um, later in the podcast, we are going to be talking about um, allyship. But right now, we're going to get back into protesting. So, um... I wanted to know, because I, I didn't get a chance to preface this question with you, but do you feel like it's dangerous to go out and protest with your partner? I know a lot of people do go out with their partners, but do you feel like it's dangerous to bring your partner? 
Um, I feel like it definitely there is like a physical risk to go out protesting right now. And I think it's a risk to bring anybody with you, um, regardless of whether they're your partner. Though I do suggest to anybody who is going out to have um, to communicate with those around you and make sure that you have a plan just in case the worst did happen and you were arrested. Um, so that you know that like those you're responsible for humans and animals are taken care of and uh, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Let's actually talk about the, the animal thing. So these kind of demonstrations and protests, like just as a caveat, cause I know some of you are probably listening to this and are like, Oh wow. Like it's so great to be empowered from the stuff that Matthew said, but you know, I also don't want to get tear gassed or whatever. Certain demonstrations like during the day, like maybe bring your kids and your pets to those. Cause it's mm -hmm. usually broad daylight speakers. It's totally mm -hmm. fine. But if you're going to be protesting after six or 7 PM, like that's not a place for your kids. That's not a place for your pets. Like, it, it just isn't like, and so be cautious when doing that. Um, we're not going to give you the bad parenting, the bad pet owner award, but seriously, we're telling you right now, don't bring your pets. <laughs> if it's you're just go really irresponsible, seven. honestly, like it's yeah. hard enough to take care of yourself and those around you and the best way that you can take care of your <laughs> loved ones, human and furry and, you know, all sorts of different folks, you know? Being on the ground is not necessarily for everybody, but um, attending some of the marches during the day, just as Coco said, um, I've, yeah, I would highly recommend that. Yeah, especially because there's a lot of speakers during the day. Um, so let's get back to it. So the, um, when, so what are some of the things that you noticed when it came to the people at night? So we talked about the people during the day, but let's talk about the people and the stuff that you saw at night. Yeah, you know, a lot of the folks in the evening are the same folks during the daytime. Um, it's remarkable the way that I've seen some people out day again and again, um, familiar faces, um, you know, offering food, water, snacks, um, first aid supplies, uh, all sorts of things. It really does feel like a community. Um, and I guess I'm new to Portland, so I don't really know the makeup of Portland, but um, you know, out at the protests at night, you know, generally middle-aged folks, a lot more white folks than others, which is literally every single, like, minute that I've been in Portland. So, um, mm -hmm. I'm not surprised, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, you know, a lot of the same people even, and a lot of the same signs, it's just that, um, folks have a direction and the chance change and, um, the risks increase, I think. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the protesting and what's protesting like before we switch over to our conversation about allyship? Um, I would just like to say that um, I'm, I'm really proud of those that have gone out and um, of the Black leadership in this community that has literally forced change to happen um, in the schools. Um, I know that the police commission vote happened today and it wasn't everything that was wanted, but I don't think a lot of that would have been achieved without the pressure. And I would just like to say that if you have the capacity to do it, I would suggest looking into ways to show up. And if you can't physically, then there are like a lot of ways to support. So like, please know that this isn't over and it's like working and it's really exciting. Yeah, it really is. And I do want to keep in mind for people, I know that we talked about protesting today, but that was kind of our big subject. But just keep in mind, there are plenty of ways to donate, just like Matthew said, um, donating time, donating resources, donating uh, monetarily and finances, um, sharing, even sharing a post on Facebook about where a march is happening is still putting in some of the good work, being able to share those live feeds and you know get the communication and the conversations out there and being ready to vote and register to vote and things like that uh, all of that's incredibly important so we're going to move into our conversation about <laughs> allyship so um as matthew has um, said a couple of times on here that he is a trans man for those of you who don't know me personally coco jim holiday um i am a bi-gender um drag queen who is also black and 
Uh, so I deal with allyship in different ways myself. Like I'm an ally to women. I'm an ally to indigenous people. Like I'm an ally to a bunch of different groups. And so is Matthew, of course. So I know this, this kind of topic is about race a little bit, but one question that I do have for you, let's kind of make it a little bit more fun. So let's talk about the do's and don'ts of allyship. So as a trans person, what are some of your do's, Matthew? Some of my do's of allyship. Um, Learn people's names. Um, I (laughs) love asking pronouns. I love figuring out people's pronouns and using the right ones, but there is a certain amount of, like we always hear about dysphoria, but we don't hear about euphoria. And I think just learning people's names and using them consistently is a big do that is underrated when it comes to being a trans ally. I think anybody can do it. And it goes a long way for people who have been really, really hoping to be recognized as such. That's interesting. And I've actually never heard the phrase euphoria um, before when it comes to trans identities, um, Mm. because I do hear dysphoria a lot. That's really interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what's one of your don'ts. Um, Something for you personally, like what is like one of your kind of your big no-nos? One of my don'ts. Um, In allyship, sorry. Yeah. I think just one thing, and and this might seem a little cliche, but um, like, I really don't like it when people tell me that I'm brave for being trans. Um, I don't know if you identify with that at all or have heard that, but um, like the bravery of it for me just kind of reinforces the fact that like, like I shouldn't have to be brave to just exist (laughs) yeah you know and and i think it's just kind of like it's an underhand like i would it would be a whole lot more genuine i think instead of saying like wow you're so brave of saying like wow (laughs) like you you have a lot you have a lot on your plate and i you know at least I I (laughs) i think i would appreciate wow i appreciate your authenticity i think i'd like that more yeah that um, one <laughs> yeah like that. authenticity because living your life authentically is kind of what the goal is for everyone to a degree so a couple of my do's and don'ts for on the racial side and actually even yeah. on the trans asterisk side um i don't so i'm a big i don't really love they them pronouns i'm a big advocate for asking someone i know i ask people who when it's clearly obvious they're cisgender and I know you shouldn't necessarily assume anybody's pronouns, but like, let's be real. We're all still human. Um, like I really appreciate they, them, uh, asking somebody what their pronouns are because then it's just, it's recorded in my head even before the first interaction. And I like that, um, so much. So, um, one thing I, one of my don'ts of allyship is that, um, I really don't like it. Um, I don't love, white saviors per se um i've lived in portland long enough to where now they kind of irritate the crap out of me um and let me explain what the term is a white savior is somebody who oftentimes will speak for you thinking that they are defending you and doing what's right um and it's it's not always super helpful and some because i always like to be like i can i can fight my own battles especially on the smaller scale, like obviously get out in those streets and march and protest. But um, like at the workplace, if somebody said something really offensive to me, like I am a strong person and I will stick up for myself. But when people jump in front of me, I feel very uncomfortable by that interaction. So, yeah. Um, So let's, so let's talk about, so allyship a little bit better. So what do you think is the making of a good ally? Um, The making of a good ally. I believe the making of a good ally, first and foremost, is um, somebody who wants to be safe for members of a particular community and those who are willing to listen and learn what that means and how to do better at it. I like that definition. So I said on Facebook today, and I'm going to see what your opinion is on this. So... There's a common theme in activist communities where you say um, if somebody has the potential of, you know, becoming a bad ally, they were never a good ally to begin with. Do you think it's possible to alienate your allies? Hmm. So I I, I'm not quite sure I understand the meaning of bad ally. 
<laughs> so an alien alienating your allies to where they become the opposition. Mm, so where they change their mind and they don't longer want yeah. to support you. <laughs> yeah, and let's actually give a let's give or, a for instance. Let's say you have a friend who knew you before um, you know, before you transitioned or whatever, and they're one of those people that it and not not a family member, a friend, mm -hmm. and it just takes them forever to learn your pronoun, um, and you're constantly berating them, and then one day you're just sick of it, and then you just kind of yell at them, you scream at them because you're so sick and tired of them misgendering you, and then they become part of the opposition to where you're like, you know what, I'm just screw this, like I tried and I wasn't good enough and I got yelled at, and so you lost an ally. Do you, so in that regard, do you think it's actually even possible to truly alienate your allies or were there just, or was that person never an ally to begin with? Mm. I feel like if the person is willing to have a conversation and understand, then they're coming from a place of wanting to be safe for you. And if they're unwilling to have that conversation, then they're no longer willing to do the work in order to be trusted. And there's a lot of personal respect and trust that goes into listening and emotions are going to happen. We're going to yell, we're going to cry. That's because this shit hurts. We're trying to learn how to love each other better. We're trying to figure out how to keep each other alive at some point when it comes to us in the queer community. And um, I think whether that person is an ally or not at the end of the day also is whether or not they're willing to potentially learn how to do it differently the next time. And if they're willing to be safe for you to talk to. That's interesting how you keep saying safe like that. That's, it's really, it, that becomes a true dif dif uh, difference between um, racial identities, obviously, and gender identities, because I can't, white people are the majority. And so I can and cannot ever really expect a white person to be a safe Mm -hmm. person for me because of white privilege and systemic racism and so that's kind of interesting i really love this conversation because of that um, dichotomy there um mm -hmm. so i forgot to ask you what is it like living in portland with a trans identifier have you um, seen it positives negatives what yeah what have you seen um well there there are a lot of visibly trans people here in Portland, and that's wonderful. I come from Denver, and Denver does have a wonderful queer community, but it's definitely um, a lot more femphobic in a lot of ways. Um, here in Portland, uh, there are a lot of trans people and a lot of out people. There are some events. Um, I know there's like a trans strip night, and there are a lot of drag performers who are out and proud and supported as trans people as well. Um, at the same time, there seems to be like an underhand reluctance to acknowledge parts of the community and the ways that things are that make trans people uncomfortable here. Um, as somebody who comes from a place where there are even fewer spaces for trans people to exist and participate in the queer community, it is terrifying to think that me speaking up about something that I see is going to create tension and therefore like exclude or isolate me further from another space. So it's kind of, you know, a catch 22, maybe I'll swallow this one, you know, which battle do you want to fight? You know, am I gonna, you know, wait in line in the women's restroom or, you know, go across the street and leave the bar. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's we... not the best, but it's definitely not the worst. <laughs> no, I don't. I totally get that. So I've always wanted to know this and you can choose to answer this question or not. But where do trans people like because I'm just going to let you speak for um, an entire group of people. Um, <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, well, I guess explain your personal definition about passability. Do you think it's a thing? Do you think it's problematic? Do you, like, what are your, what are your feelings on passability? I mean, passing is definitely just a thing, I think. <laughs> like, it it's happens, <laughs> it, it happens every time you're misgendered, you're not like that's okay 
it's gross. Like passing as in like <laughs> visibly not trans. Like I, I hate the word, but it's a thing because I have passing privilege and my life allows me to ignore the fact that I'm trans sometimes. I have days where I wake up and I go to sleep and there's so much hair on my chest that I forget that I'm trans. And like, <laughs> that is literally some people's dream, but at the same time, like, uh, like it is what it is. I don't. Ugh. Yeah. What's actually really, what do you think about it? <laughs> so, yeah. So, well, just to share this story, when I first met Matthew, he yelled at me. Um, actually it was the second time <laughs> I met Matthew, but, um, it's actually how we became better friends. Cause he actually talked to me about it later. Cause he knows he hurt my feelings. Um, so <laughs> I, um, for lack of better terms, Matthew is a little bit shorter. Um, I'm going to throw that out there because, um, yes. so Matthew to me, and it is a, it's problematic and not problematic. We all have eyes. Like Matthew is very passable. Um, mm -hmm. and so I just thought he was short. I did. <laughs> and then he told me outside of our one day, he's like, you know, he's like, you do. He basically told me I'm a trans man and that bothers me. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know you were trans. And that's not a compliment, by the way. Don't, don't ever say that to a yeah. trans person. Oh my God, I didn't even know you were trans. Like you're almost real. Like that's what it sounds like. And it's problematic as <laughs> shit. Um, <laughs> and so then he talked to me later at a bar. He's like, you know, I just want to have a conversation about that. And, and, and I, what I appreciate about those, both of those moments is like, I know the emotional labor that goes into constantly having to explain your identity to another person. Um, and Matthew is kind enough to have a conversation with a person he didn't necessarily have to have a conversation with. So I love that. But to answer your question, um, passability, um, it almost feels like a chance, like in the sense of, so when, so proximity to whiteness kind of almost guarantees how much racism you're going to see in your life as a black person and black people can be all different shades even if your mom and dad are both very dark you might actually be a little lighter um than them and you'll have that um what we call light skin privilege that your parents might not get to experience so i so i love the fact that matthew offered that term about you know passing privilege because no one knows definitively what they're going to look like when they begin to transition. Um, they don't know how passable they be, how fast um, they're going to look passable or anything like that. So like this whole journey um, is kind of the luck of a draw. So it's not anything about the specific person about how passable they are because they can't help it. So like to dwell on it in any capacity does seem problematic because of that reason. But it's also, we do have eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. And there's a very real, like, there's a very real, um, there's a, it's very real that, like, I drove from Colorado through Wyoming and Utah and Idaho to get here to Portland, and I didn't fear for my safety in a gas station. And, like, that's real. We need to acknowledge that, too. Yeah, we really do. I mean, yeah, because... Honestly, the proximity to whiteness for black people can be an indicator of how safe you are. Um, and we just really need to acknowledge that. So a couple of other just inappropriate questions to ask my trans fan on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an interesting discussion, and I'm kind of be interested to hear what you have to think about this. So as a trans man, um, somebody who we've both indicated is a bit passable, uh, do you find yourself riddled with white male privilege or um, in any capacity? Yes. 100, 200% yes. Um. And, and I know, um, and let me, Emily, ask this question. So obviously before you transitioned or whatever, um, do you notice that, do you notice the difference actually from like when you were little to now? Absolutely. I do. Um, I notice it in ways that are empowering and I notice it in ways that are um, discouraging. Um, really? One of the empowering ways is that uh, I'm encouraged to speak out about opinions that may differ, for, uh, differ from others. And I'm encouraged to engage in passionate conversation that may even look like argument sometimes. And the way that I was socialized was that that is how you um, that is how you uh, 
don't engage with people. That is how you become, you know, a problem and a burden. And, you know, it's better to just not confront people. Whereas, you know, male privilege is people saying, you know, go get them, you go tell them and fuck what they think, you know? Um, yeah. On the other hand, like, uh, even like we said, like traveling across the country, feeling safe, there's another thing like, you know, feeling safe in spaces because I don't have a visibly female body is like a huge privilege that I don't think we realize. I mean, like I will never forget having a conversation with other trans men and realizing that we all cross the street when we realize we're walking behind a woman who's walking alone because we have all been in the place of knowing that there is a man walking behind us. And I think that queer people, trans people and drag performers all can identify with the feeling that you are being targeted for your gender. And um, I don't think that my experiences in that way are any different or special from others. I mean, I think drag queens in drag face a lot of the violence that trans women cannot escape by existing in the world. And so it's, you know, that solidarity right there that I think can bring people closer together. You know, I've never actually admitted this before, and I think that some people will find this phrase to be problematic, but I need to just kind of share this. Um, when I started Black Lives Matter in Grand Junction, Colorado, I and learned all the statistics about Black trans women um, to a degree, and here's the part where it gets a little uncomfortable. It actually made me less likely to go out in face presenting as a woman uh, I used to do it like to go like out, let's all have a good night as drag queens, like let's go to the bar and we're gonna drink and whatever. And we're gonna walk to a bunch of different bars. And after that moment, it made it less fun and interesting for me because <coughs> there was always this back of my mind that I could be next. Cause some of those trans women, especially over the last four years, they were, tr they were also drag queens as well as they were black trans women. Um, and it's not saying like somebody mistaking me for a trans person and they want to murder me because of it. It's I the statistic was so uncomfortable that it made that experience make me feel very unsafe to like walk around in full face because um, I like I just didn't want to be next. And I know that some people will probably think that that's problematic, but I mean, fears are fears for a reason. Um, we're we're seeing you know black trans women being murdered and and it's uncomfortable and it's sad and it's heartbreaking and we should do everything in our power to stop it but it's not stopped as of this the recent of this podcast and so that fear is very real for me it's absolutely um, real and you and your life and your livelihood and your mental health are all the most important parts i think of supporting you as a person never mind like allyship for gender identity for race let's talk about like supporting the people in our lives and all of the intersectional identities that we each carry because in the end of the day like who do we have but each other you know it's so true and it's funny because i always like i always say like i absolutely and completely and unequivocally agree that uh that all lives matter i really do i think we all do um all lives matter to a degree um but there are so many things that we specifically that we need to focus on so we can change it. Um, trans voices and trans lives matter, black lives matter, of course. Um, so just a couple of, a couple more questions before we finish up here. So when it comes to, cause this is about like, cause a lot of people listening to this, they're probably allies to these identifiers and these labels. Mm -hmm. um, what's one thing that you could encourage allies to do? Um. I would encourage allies to not be afraid of words like racism or transphobia or other labels that have been used um, to talk about things that happen, right? We have to have words to acknowledge that things exist, but those words don't represent what those things look like today. And Ooh, interesting. I think when we can recognize that folks are already allies and they come with the intention of supporting and learning and getting better, that 
what feels like wanting to defend yourself. I'm not racist. I'm not transphobic. Those kinds of statements can be replaced with things like, I don't want to hurt you as a trans person. I don't want to perpetuate the racism you're facing. Like, I am clearly hurting you and being open to changing and getting better because like, if we don't have those folks, then we don't have anyone either. Um, yeah. And the words are like big and scary and maybe we just need to like come up with new ones, but at the same time, like we need to not be afraid of them either because they exist su systemically. They are insidious and terrifying and we just need to not be afraid of the word themselves and get to the real discussion. I was talking to your partner this afternoon about the terms racist and transphobic, actually. And the thing is, I do agree with you. Um, I also believe that if we use, because we know that people are so afraid of those words mm -hmm. that it shuts down dialogue so immediately. Like, as an activist, I always feel like I use racist in certain ways. Like, I'll be like, wow, that phrase was really racist. Or I'll be like, yikes, like, that was a bit racist on your part. Let's try to do better. Or or if they're actually just being racist, then I'll just call them racist, of course. Because what I've noticed when I call somebody transphobic or I call somebody racist, they shut down so fast that I feel like the education can't happen. And I mm -hmm. do. So it's like I agree with you. I really wish that people wouldn't have. Um, they wouldn't be so blocked by those words or so terrified by those words, because usually what it should be is like, whoa, that was really problematic and like borderline racist. What I would want people to do is like to check their ego and to check themselves and be like, whoa, was that racist? And then like, could you explain like, cause some people do want to learn. So we need to make sure that we're open to communication and dialogue. If people are willing and have the capacity to do that emotional labor. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of my final thing that I wanted to talk to you about here is like, so your partner has been through the Rahinger on the face of books. Um, and online. <laughs> and um, so what I was going to ask you is mm. what um, what do you see the disconnect is between um, how people are reacting online to the things that this person has always said to how they're receiving it now? What do you mm -hmm. think the disconnect is? Do you think it's just because of the protests, because of COVID? Um, what do you think it is? Mm. Well, I, I do want to connect some things that you said back in your last statement before the question to my answer oh, sure. to this question. Go ahead. And that is um, like calling people racist or calling people transphobic um, and the definitions of those words. Like historically um, and in the dictionary definition that they are reportedly going to be changing. Thank you, Miriam Webster. I heard that on Trevor Noah's show. So if it's wrong, oh. it's his fault. Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, there's this notion that things like racist or transphobic means hating a person because of their race or because they are trans or that kind of thing, where thinking about more of a systemic version of the way these groups have been marginalized uh, leads to realizing that um, things like racism or transphobia, for lack of a better word that doesn't have the word phobia in it, um, <laughs> like end up perpetuating is in policies and attitudes and actions and behaviors that further treat groups differently from one another and lead to the perpetuation of those groups continuing to not be treated the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I mean, of course, I think that folks might have other definitions of those kinds of terms. Sure. And sure. that's just um, like some of my perspective on it as a white person, <laughs> all mm -hmm. like put that out there. But um, I think when I see trans folks being treated differently from others, it it's a personal cord. Um, and I think Portland is having a hard time seeing some of the nuances of their own behavior and how their reactions to certain statements to transphobia communicate what they're 
feelings about the importance or the even existence of that transphobia may really be. It feels like there's a lot of questioning and a lot of defensiveness instead of outreach and support and willingness to help. And that really hurts. At the same time, we are in the middle of a huge movement that needs to center Black voices and Black lives. Um, consistently, Black voices and lives are being taken away. Black Lives Matter is like a great statement with the words, but it's a trademark. It's part of a movement that has literally gained momentum and means something to so many people more than just those words themselves. And so like, sure, all lives can matter and have value, but like there is no all lives matter because Black Lives Matter is a movement that deserves right. attention. And so there needs to be a way to recognize and call out problematic behavior and support people while also like not have that take away from voices that need to be centered right now because we're not going to have this like intersectional allyship if folks can't simultaneously hold themselves accountable to like their own behaviors towards other individuals and also recognize that we're all on the same team and we're all still like trying to show up for one another and right now showing up for one another still means Black Lives Matter and centering Black voices because this shit is like way far from fixed at all. It's not going right. to get fixed, but like it's not, it's not time to move on. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. And we do need to be, I know that this movement is the forefront and we want to use this momentum. We want to make this change now because of the momentum. But if the finish line means that we've completely and utterly silenced our tr uh, trans siblings to get there, then it's going to feel dirty. So mm. my ask for all my listeners out there, um, all our listeners out there, is just to make sure that when we are having these dialogues, that we remember it's just as important to be inclusive in our anger. It's just as important to be inclusive with our rage and our activism and our message. Because yes, um, we have the go right now, so let's take our shot and see how much progress we can make. But we also have to remember that black trans women are being murdered. And it's not just because they're black. And we have to remember that. And so let's make sure we amplify the voices um, across the board because Black Lives Matter um, does not exclude trans voices, black trans voices. Um, so with that, um, a couple of my final words are, make sure that we are, are being, we are all being kind to one another. These sensitive times are hard. They really are. And we are trying to make a difference in the community and in our world. And hopefully we make it. We might not, but hopefully we effing do. What are your final words for the folks, Matthew? Um, my final words is uh, be good to each other and stay good in your hearts. This shit is heavy. People are having a hard time. Um, remember to tell each other that you love each other. And the first part of being an ally is to take care of the people who are experiencing that marginalization. Yeah, definitely. Okay, everybody. Um, that is it for this episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. Uh, we have no Feed the Positive uh, this week because Donna is out. Um, we will have contact information on our website. Once again, our website is www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That's www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. You can find us on anywhere you listen to podcasts. We release episodes every Thursday. Um, make sure to be on the lookout for us. And if you do get a chance, please rate us a five. That really helps us out a lot. And you'll hear from us next week. Uh, say bye to the folks, Matthew. Bye. Bye, everybody. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. 
original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. 